Hey everyone! So in the last video in this series, we saw Kent Hovind making some pretty ridiculous claims about what he thinks evolution is and why it's bad, and then coming up with some really odd, kind of unscientific definitions for a lot of stuff surrounding evolution. If you haven't seen part one, I will link it in the description below and pop it as a pinned comment. I really recommend you go check it out first. It's not quite as science heavy as like say this video is gonna be, but it does give you an overview to kind of like some of his views and a little bit about his educational background or lack of it um, and why he wrote this book in the first place. In this video, we are gonna be looking at what Kent describes as the specific lies used to teach evolution in just about every science textbook in the world. So we're getting a little bit more specific in this, we're looking at some of his actual claims and then looking at the actual science that debunks them. He lists a hell of a lot, and I don't think I'm gonna be able to cover all of them, I'm just gonna cover the kind of like interesting ones, um, and also the ones that, you know, I actually know enough to talk about. The ones that relate more to kind of like physics and stuff like that, it's not my strong point, it's not something I've studied anywhere past GCSE to be honest. So I think there are better people, more qualified to talk about that stuff than me, so I'm gonna be leaving those um, and talking about the ones that I do know about, you know, because I think that's gonna lead to a more entertaining video, it's gonna lead to a more accurate video, it's just gonna be better all around, you know? That said, the first claim we're gonna look at is centered around geology. And again, I haven't touched this since I was about 16, so, talking a good decade now. That's a lie. Um, obviously, I have an interest in it, I read a lot of books on the topic, but I've not studied it in an academic setting since I was 16. That said, while I'm not hugely familiar with geology, I thought it was worth mentioning because you're kind of gonna see how ridiculous and extreme his views are from this example. You're also gonna see how he doesn't back up his claims with any evidence. He just kind of sees um, almost like correlating events and assumes causation. It's it's odd, you'll see what I mean. So according to Kent, the idea that the Grand Canyon took millions of years to form is a lie. Like I say, this isn't my area of expertise, but I did a fair bit of research after reading this part of the book, um, and apparently some experts say that the canyon may have formed 70 million years ago, some say it may have formed 20 million years ago, some say it's closer to five to six million years ago. But the consensus is we are definitely talking about millions of years. It was almost definitely a slow, gradual process of erosion over time, most likely by water, but I guess there's a chance that, um, and it's likely that some erosion at least was done by the wind and other factors. I'll pop some links uh, for kind of like further reading down below if you wanna find out some more details. Some are kind of like nice, easy to read, easy to understand links. Some of the like links and further reading stuff I'll be including just in general are more kind of academic and in depth. So the idea is there's gonna be something for everyone if you wanna go and find out more about these topics. Like I say, there's slightly like differing ideas um, about the specifics of how the Grand Canyon formed, but I think the main takeaway is this. This is, real science in practice. We don't have a solid an answer yet, we don't know the full story, but as we gather more evidence, we're updating the explanations and coming up with new theories and new ideas. That's real science in practice and it's amazing. Despite not knowing the exact details, there are some matters of consensus. For example, to use this quote, the river uses sediment and rocks like chisels and sandpaper to chip away its channel. It has tremendous erosive power because it's fast flowing with a large volume, enabling it to carry large amounts of debris. Arizona's arid climate means rock is unprotected by vegetation, making it more susceptible to erosion. So these are all kind of like fairly basic things that we do get taught at GCSE that these things happen, and they're just saying that this happened on a really large scale to form the Grand Canyon over millions of years, right? What is puzzling about the Grand Canyon is that the way the river currently flows doesn't seem to make much sense because it's kind of backwards to what you'd expect but there are a few theories about this involving like uplifting rock due to like tectonic activity and stuff um, and the river then changing direction and stuff um, because of like different levels if that makes sense. Like I say, I'm not the most qualified person to talk about this but if you want some more information on this, check out the National Park Service website link that I've listed below uh, for some interesting details about like what scientists know and how they know it and that sort of thing. Um, it's a great little resource. Kent, however, the Grand Canyon forming is a very different process in his mind. Uh, he thinks it's much simpler than all this. He writes in his book, to cut through the ridge, the river would have to flow uphill. Rivers do not flow uphill. 
So the question would be, how did the river start cutting the canyon? Anyone with half a brain should realize that there <laughs> used to be a huge lake behind where the Grand Canyon currently is. This lake overflowed the top at some time in the past and carved the canyon in a matter of weeks. And here's evidence for this claim. Three miniature Grand Canyons were formed in a matter of hours after Mount St. Helens exploded in 1980. So one, we're just going to ignore that they were miniature and not to the same scale as the Grand Canyon at all. So the comparison isn't quite there, to be honest. We're also just not going to talk about how those miniature canyons were formed as a result of a volcanic explosion. Do you know how much energy there is behind the water and lava there? And that's before we even begin to talk about the fact that it was affecting a completely different kind of rock. I mean, like I say, I haven't done geology and tectonics since I was 16, but even I know these two events are not directly comparable. I would like a little more solid evidence for Kent's theory here uh, before <laughs> I begin to like even start to consider it because it is ridiculous. And he does offer up more evidence-ish you just have to pay a lot of money for it. Seriously, this is what he does. He makes these ridiculous claims, doesn't back it up, and says, if you want to see the evidence, pay me X amount of dollars for my seminar. I'm like, no, I'm not giving you money to spout crap. Skipping forward a little bit in his book, um, Kent writes that lie number three that's in um, science textbooks is that natural selection causes evolution. So he actually gets off to quite a good start with this because he knows that natural selection certainly happens, but it's only a selection process. Well, yeah. And then he ruins it by saying, it does not create anything. Well, yeah, and who claimed that? No one. It's a literal straw man. Even Kyra's grumbling at it. I love you, babe. <laughs> I know I love you too. So Kent writes that natural phenomenon such as weather may select a particular species of dog to survive. For example, in cold climates, only dogs with thick fur will survive. In hot climates, dogs with thinner fur tend to survive better. This process is not creating anything new in the dog family. It's only selecting a slice of the gene code that already exists. Exactly. Now take that understanding and run with it. Keep going with it. You're onto something here. Darwin wrote about evolution via natural selection. He's not saying natural selection is the means for mutations arising in the first place. Not even a little bit. The way that we understand it today and the way that Darwin wrote about it and everything is that evolution is the genetic changes to a population over time. Natural selection is the process by which organisms with better suited genetic traits are more likely to survive thus causing the genetic pool of a population to change over time. The genetic changes arise via mutations. That's kind of a whole different process. I mean, obviously it's connected, but natural selection doesn't cause genetic mutations, and no one's claiming it does. Honestly, even evolution isn't the cause of genetic mutations. So genetic errors such as, I don't know, maybe transcription errors or... Um, I don't know, many other things. Like, we, we will come to talk about proper, like, genetic mutation errors either later in this video or in another video. I, I can't quite remember where I put it. We will talk about it in more detail. But basically, yeah, random mutation may cause some dogs to have longer fur and some dogs to have shorter fur, right? Like, this, we're, we're talking in the beginning now when I say random mutation. Um, climate may then be a selection pressure, which means in warmer climates, the dogs with longer fur die because they're overheating, and in colder climates, the dogs with shorter fur die because they're freezing to death, right? Over a few generations, this means that most of the dogs in those populations are going to have the um, advantageous genetic traits, right? Because the others will have died off. So in warmer climates, the short-haired dogs will survive and breed and pass on the short-haired gene to their offspring. And in colder climates, the long-haired dogs will survive and breed and pass on their genetic traits to their offspring. That's all natural selection is. Um, and as much as Kent seems to want to deny it, that's evolution. This one was a simple example because it's just warm climate, cold climate, long fur, short fur. But take that nice, simple, easy to understand example and realize that there are tons of selection pressures in the world. There's climate, weather, predators, food, shelter, all sorts. And there's also tons of genes being selected for. Uh, some are obvious, some aren't. And then realize that this is happening over millions and millions and millions of years, not just a handful of generations. 
We're talking millions of generations, to be honest. Honestly, with this point, and admitting that natural selection is a thing, Kent is literally giving solid evidence for evolution. It's just that he's claiming it's not evidence for evolution because he has some weird straw manny definition of what evolution actually is. It's like me saying, look, bears don't exist. I have never seen a bear. And then someone comes along to me and says, hey, look, no, here's a bear. This is what it eats. This is where it lives. This is where it poops. This is family. Uh, people have studied these bears for hundreds of years. Like we, we know these bears exist. Look at them. It's right in front of you. And I say, no, 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 no. That's not a bear. This is a bear. And unless you show me this specific kind of bear, no bears exist. And when they reply with, but that's not what a bear is, I'm just like, there's no evidence for bears. That's kind of what's happening here. <laughs> Next up, lie number four is titled simply, Moth Evolved. Please, Kent, don't be afraid to use more words. You might actually get some meaning across then. Kent writes that textbooks often show the peppered moth as an example of evolution. That's because it's a nice, simple, relatable example that we have observed in front of us. It makes sense, it's easy for kids to understand. I actually spoke about this when I was on uh, Talk Heathen, I think, with Eric. And it's a great simple example of natural selection that we have a lot of evidence for. It works. But, Kent says, the entire story is a total fabrication of the truth. Someone glued dead moths to a tree trunk to take the picture that is often shown in textbooks. Oh Kent, please take the tinfoil hat off. This isn't the big conspiracy that you think it is. And even if some textbooks photos are staged. For example, like when you see kids working in textbooks, do you really think they're doing their homework there? No, they're not. They're posing for a photo. Sometimes textbooks do that. Doesn't mean those events don't actually happen. Even if someone posed moth photos in a textbook, they still evolved by natural selection. So bizarre. Like, oh, I can't believe he's using that as a way to try and say evolution's a lie. It, it, it's weird, right? It's weird. He goes on to write, the truth of the matter is, the moths have always produced two colours of babies, dark and light, obviously. Um, even if the story they tell about the trees turning dark from pollution and the dark trees providing camouflage for the dark moths were true, it is not! It would still not be an example of evolution. But it is true, and that's exactly an example of an external pressure changing the overall genetics of a population. It is an example of microevolution. He goes on to say, uh, nothing would have changed, it's still a moth, it's still the same species of moth, only the percentage of the population would have changed. Don't let someone use the peppered moth story to mislead you into believing that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Like I said, it's microevolution, we're not talking about speci speciesation here, we're just talking about an example of a genetic change in a population which Kent has even admitted can happen, so I don't get why he's trying to deny this. Like, it only happened over a few generations, so it's not macroevolution, there wasn't time for it to be macroevolution. Oh my god, and what the hell is with his whole, like, um, we all came from a rock thing? Like, where does he get these ideas? He's literally being ridiculous, no one's claiming we came from a rock. The next point sounds so much like satire that I'm really struggling to believe it's not. Line number five is apparently, homologous structures show common ancestry. Kent writes, biology textbooks nearly always claim that the similar structure of, our mo of most four-limbed animals are proof that they have a common ancestor. This of course is ridiculous. The similar structure of these animals' limbs prove they have a common designer, not a common ancestor. If you study the subject more deeply, you will learn that the bones of these different animals come from, a totally, come from totally different genes in the chromosomes. They are not homologous structures as the textbook says, they are simply an example of an amazing design. Someone is trying to deceive you. So since he didn't actually cite a source for his claim about the same types of bones coming from totally different genes, I found it very difficult to fact check this and know whether it was accurate or not. Um, like so many of his claims, it seems it was pulled directly from his bomb. I'm wondering if he's maybe mixing up some features of like homologous and analogous structures perhaps, but honestly, I have no idea. I mean, if only he would actually cite his references, like say, pff, a science textbook has to. His next point is super dishonest. Um, he references, reca oh, I 
I can't even say this, recapitulation theory, um, and then tries to debunk it while saying stuff like, this teaching needs to be removed from the real science textbooks. It's interesting that this idea has been proven wrong since 1875, and yet is still used in textbooks all across the world as evidence for evolution. Except that's the point, it is debunked, and it's not taught as scientific fact in any reputable textbook. I don't know what textbooks they're giving you at the dodgy Christian clubs that you teach at, but in reputable science textbooks, in decent schools, this is not taught as fact. It's not. I mean, I've heard that there are some outdated US textbooks that did include it at one point, um, but today no genuine accredited peer-reviewed textbook would ever try and claim it as fact. And honestly, if some schools are using textbooks with this theory in, then I think it's just another argument for why we need better funding for education in certain schools. I know the school I went to, it was a very like poorly funded school, and we did have some old textbooks. It was mostly like maths and stuff, um, which isn't too bad because maths at that level doesn't really change. So it was okay to have a 20 year old textbook. That wasn't a problem. But like, even with limited funding, my school at least always put into getting up to date science textbooks and making sure that was kind of, you know, done right. Kent then again, honestly, like in a really dishonest way, then tries to re relate this to a uh, pro-choice abortion arguments. It's also a heartrending fact that this is the only scientific evidence used to justify abortion. No, it's literally not. No pro-choicer would ever use this debunked theory to say, well, this is why we want abortions. He says, abortionists would like for us to believe that the baby growing inside the mother is not yet a human being. Not the argument I use. I say up to a certain point, it's not a sentient individual. Big difference. Nothing could be further from the truth. Someone is trying to brainwash you. It's a flat out disgusting lie that's trying to demonize pro-choicers by literally strawmanning them. He clearly does not understand the pro-choice position. As someone who is pro-choice, pro I'd never say, oh, go ahead, have an abortion. That thing growing inside you is not human. Look, it has gills. It's an animal. No one would ever say that. I would never say that. It's bizarre and completely untrue. I don't believe an embryo becomes a sentient or conscious human, sentient or conscious being the operative words, until a later stage in pregnancy. Um, I did a couple of collabs with Holy Kool-Aid on this. Again, I'll link them below. I'm personally really proud of how they turned out. They're quite science heavy. Thomas did an absolutely fantastic job on his parts. It was a pleasure to work with him on them. The pro-choice stance has literally nothing to do with the debunked, outdated recapitulation theory. Reading this book is literally like playing fallacy bingo. Should I have turned this into a drinking game? Next video. <laughs> Anyway, with these uh, four lies literally debunked, um, I sound like Steve now, um, I think this seems like a good place for us to stop today. Let me know which lie you thought was the worst. Let me know actually if you did think he made any good points in general. If you have any sources for, because um, the stuff about um, like homologous structures and certain limbs being like coded for by different chromosomes. If any of you have any like sources or anything to read about stuff like that, I'd be very interested. If you know what Kent's source is, please drop me a link because I do kind of want to find out more about that. But yeah, until then, let me know what you thought of this book. Let me know what you thought of my critiques of it. Let me know what you think of Kent Hovind in general. He is very bothered by me making these videos. He keeps challenging me to a debate. Um, to which I will say, I'm not a debater, I'll be honest, it's not a strong point of mine, it's not a skill I've ever had a chance to learn, and so I feel like if I did want to start debating at any point, Kent Hovind is probably not the best person to start with, because he is notoriously um, kind of dishonest in his debates. Aaron Ra has been lovely enough to offer me like some help and advice if I need it, like going forward with him. And I love Aaron, he's such a good guy. When we were in Texas, like we went out for drinks a few times, he's so, so lovely. He's sweet, he's kind, he's so smart. Um, I, I can't remember where I'm going with this, I'm just kind of like gushing and fangirling a little bit now. But anyway, like I say, this seems like a good place to stop. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate it so much and I'll see you again soon. Thank you so, so much to everyone supporting me on Patreon this month, with a special thank you going to Data Jack, Gambit and Chauffeur, Liv's Pantyhose Addiction, Christian Berg, Jaden Shepard, Robert Corte, Peter Kerouac, Sir Michael Moore, Christina the Atheist, Christian Opitz, Sage Villarreal, Greg Lad, and Lauren Hart. You and everyone else supporting me on Patreon is absolutely amazing, and I wouldn't be able to do this without you. Thank you so much.